for Kierkegaard, it's very important that God puts aside his might and power and comes to us as an, uh, an ordinary human uh, who suffers with us and not just for us, but with us, uh, and thereby shows us that his love for us is real. Uh, it isn't just something that he affirms in a verbal way, but uh, he, uh, he lives it. Welcome everyone to today's AMA. We're very pleased to welcome Professor C. Stephen Evans, or Charles Stephen Evans, however you prefer. Um, he is Professor of Philosophy and Humanities at Baylor University. His primary areas of interest in philosophy are on the philosophy of Soren Kierkegaard, the philosophy of religion, philosophy of human science, uh, sciences, and metaethics, um, as well as some of the uh, intersections of these topics. Um, he has several books exploring the philosophy of um, Soren Kierkegaard, as well as um, books on Christianity in general and, and, and metaethics and theism. Uh, some of these books will come up in, in the course of the conversation. So um, he also has a, a variety of published articles. And, and feel free to add anything to that. But uh, with that, welcome, Professor Evans. Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add is that my current project uh, is uh, actually in virtue ethics. I'm, I'm working on uh, uh, the idea of accountability as a virtue rather than simply accountability as holding someone accountable. Uh, living accountably. So that's my, I had a, a grant from the Templeton Religion Trust, and uh, I have a team of about 10 people, and uh, we're we're an interdisciplinary team. So we're working on the idea that it's better for human beings to be accountable when we're accountable in the right way to the right people. Uh, our lives flourish. So accountability turns out to be not just a condition, but a virtue. Oh, awesome. So I guess, yeah. We'll talk about that some more, and I guess we can start with some questions on ethics and, and meta-ethics. Um, do you think that this notion of accountability is just entailed by some of your views on the obligations that we have? So when you think of uh, God's commands as imposing or generating obligations for us, is does that sort of entail these facts about our accountability, or is that something separate? No, they're definitely connected. Uh, this, I mean, th this project sort of grew out of my work in uh, divine command theories of moral obligation, uh, because I, I do believe uh, that, as Kierkegaard did, that we humans live before God and we're accountable to God. But rather than seeing that as a sort of threat or a problem, uh, I wanted to get back to the ancient Hebrew conception that uh, to the fear of the Lord is a virtue. So to be accountable to God uh, is something, it's a gift, something that makes our lives richer and fuller. So that, that was, uh, there, there's the connection uh, between my earlier work and, uh, and, and this work. So maybe that's good enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So, so when we say, maybe I just like some more clarity on when we say that we're accountable to God, um, in in that uh, we've committed some sort of moral wrong, in, in when we fail to uh, what uh, follow God's commands, or what is it exactly that our accountability entails? Well, let, let, let's step back for a moment, because on my view, accountability is what I would call a relational virtue. It's like gratitude um, and uh, some other virtues. So gratitude is a virtue which one can manifest towards other humans and in interpersonal relationships. But of course, if you're a religious person, if you're a theist, you can also, uh, you think you should be grateful to God. In the same way, we humans have many relationships in which we are accountable to each other, uh, some of them mutual, uh, some some more hierarchical, uh, and, and so on. Um, and so accountability turns out to be a virtue that, like gratitude, figures into what we might call interpersonal relationships. But it's very important, I think, that there is also what I would call uh, what we might call global accountability, a sense that we're accountable 
for our lives as a whole. And that, I think, is best understood in a theistic context. Although, interestingly, there are non-theistic philosophers who also believe that we are accountable globally in this way. Um, so uh, there's, there's, it's an interesting project. How, how would that work on the non-theistic picture? Except, I mean, it, if we're accountable, we're accountable to someone, right? Is that, I mean, that, presumably that's the literally, thing. literally that's true. I think. Um, and that's why I'm ultimately going to argue that for the superiority of the theistic, what I would call, I think that humans have a kind of built-in sense that we are accountable for how we live. Uh, this comes out in all kinds of ways. I think it comes out in the uh, in the doctrine of karma in Eastern religions. I think it comes out in the sort of human uh, tendency to uh, interpret uh, if something bad happens, we sometimes say, well, what did I do to deserve that? We we just have this sense that our lives, that we're all accountable. Now, I think it's not the case that every time something bad happens that you're being punished. That's, I think, mistaken. But it is interesting how often people think that way or or uh, or so. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to argue ultimately that the theistic interpretation of this global sense uh, is superior to, to a non-theistic interpretation, but uh, some people, uh, for ex uh, they're they're philosophers who sort of say we have this sense of accountable and we feel accountable, but but there's no uh, they don't. You would think maybe they would just say, well, we're accountable to ourselves, as as maybe a Kantian might say, or, or accountable to other people, but they don't use they don't take that view necessarily uh, i'm thinking here specifically of dworkin dworkin has this sense that we're accountable to uh for our whole lives he calls it responsible rather than accountable but it's the same kind of concept but he doesn't think we're accountable just to ourselves or to other people because if that were the case we could be released but dworkin says that this uh this this uh responsibility to you know we're, we have to live in this responsible way. There's no way we can be released from it. It's something that's just sort of innate in the human condition. Uh, as conscious beings, we're sort of faded. My own view is that he has a kind of uh, sense that he is living before God, but as an atheist, a non-believer, he just doesn't understand that or recognize it. All right, but on the... On the theistic picture, we couldn't be sort of released by God from these uh, requirements? Well, this is and the interesting part for me is a lot of people, want, when they think of accountability, they think of only accountability in the context of mistakes or screw ups or wrongdoing. So uh, I'm accountable when I do wrong. But on, on the picture that our team is developing, that's not the case. Uh, we're accountable to each other, and in fact, we like to be accountable because uh, when we're doing something well or interesting, somebody needs to notice. We want people to notice and recognize, and being accountable provides that kind of recognition that we all that we all seek. And and ultimately, I think the most the the deepest, most deeply satisfying kind of recognition is when God sort of recognizes us. So it's important not to see God simply as a kind of uh, punisher or a paymaster, uh, but he is the one to whom we are accountable, but he wants us to be accountable to him solely for our good. Uh, God is completely loving and good, and even though sometimes his love takes the form of what we might call tough love, ultimately uh, God only wants our good, and that's why being accountable to God is not something to fear. Uh, in the sense of being afraid of, but something to welcome. It's a gift that we should embrace. Interesting. Yeah, there's a lot to ex explore there, but I wanted to talk um, more specifically about God's <clears throat> goodness and, and his commands and the sort of uh, weight they carry, morally speaking. Um, when we say that God is all good or perfectly good or just good in general, um, what exactly are we saying? I think a lot of people might have a sort of intuitive sense, but 
maybe it's not very clear, especially if goodness is like defined in terms of God or God's um, commands or something like that. Is it somewhat vacuous then to say that God is good or to kind of understand the, the concern that I'm getting at? Yeah, well, the, the concept of the good, of course, is a deeply important and rich one. And it's gone back in the history of Western thought, you know, at least to Socrates and Plato and probably before uh, that. And I think when we say that God is good, what we're saying is something like this. Uh, the good has both a kind of content, and, and we, we have a sense of here's what a good person is like, but also uh, a sense of transcendence. We know that our understanding of the good is not perfect. And one of the, one of the characteristics that I think it's important uh, to have in a concept of the good is to recognize that our understanding is imperfect and can be improved. So uh, perhaps there was a period in Western culture when most people thought that human slavery was, if not good, at least not bad either, or at least permissible or tolerable. But almost no one thinks that now. Uh, and so our conception of the good can change. And that's because our human ideas about the good are always subject to criticism because the good has this sort of transcendent quality. It exceeds our, our understanding. And I think that applies when we say God is good. In part, we say God is good because he has certain characteristics that we think of as uh, as good. But we also are saying that he transcends our understanding of good and he could surprise us. Uh, uh, we, we could learn. Uh, I am, for example, uh, not uh, currently a vegetarian, but perhaps in a few years, uh, I'll change my view and think that the good demands that I be a vegetarian. And, and so uh, I have to be open to the possibility that my understanding of the good uh, is fallible and finite. I don't think it could be totally wrong. I mean, we couldn't say, we, we couldn't just say that our ideas of that good are totally wrong or false, because then when we say God is good, we wouldn't ha have any idea what we meant. But But we are, I think, we do have to say that God's, uh, God's goodness transcends our understanding of the good and can surprise us. Although perhaps in retrospect, we come to see what was a surprise as something that we should have seen all along. Maybe that would be true, for example, about the evils of slavery and the goodness of abolishing slavery. Uh, something that we think now we should have seen all along, but we didn't. At least most people didn't. Okay, that's that's helpful. So in but I have in mind, I guess the, the following sort of hypothetical springs to mind in that suppose there's two people that agree about um, the God's moral character as it pertains to some of his actions or attributes and that they, they agree that those are, are good. Um, but then there's some new attribute of God or action of God that, that is discovered by them. And then they sort of disagree over the... Um, the moral properties of that action or attribute. One of them thinks it's good and the other one thinks it isn't. Um, presumably the one that thinks it is good is is right. I mean, but what, what explains, what is it that explains their being right in that case and not the other person, if that makes any sense? Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm a moral realist, so I think that ultimately the good is uh, an objective reality and what makes it right is just being uh, more in accord with uh, with the with the with the way things really are, including the way the good uh, really is. And obviously, as we're all finite, infallible human beings, uh, we do have disagreements. So, for example, even within, say, among religious people, there are disagreements over, say, the goodness of uh, homosexual relationships. Some traditional uh, religious people still think these are morally dubious or questionable, and some people now think, no, they are really uh, where our eyes are being opened. This is a, an issue like slavery where our, we need to change and, uh, and, and re refocus our understanding of the good. So presumably one party is right and one party is wrong, uh, but uh, I wish I had an algorithm uh, to uh, enable us to settle those kinds of questions. But unfortunately, 
uh, we're, we're stuck with being finite and fallible, not to mention, uh, I think, also sinful. So we, uh, we don't right. always get it right. We don't always get it right. We ought to be a, li- willing to listen to those who disagree with us and take seriously their objections and, and, and be as honest as we can be in thinking those through. But at the end of the day, we still have to say, this is what I think is true. This is the way the world looks to me, and I'm going to try and, uh, and be responsible to my understanding of, of what's right and what's good. All right, and so you have a book from either 2013 or 2014 called God and Moral Obligation, and right. in there you sort of describe and defend against various objections a version of divine command theory. And I wanted to ask some questions about, about the um, objections that you respond to and your responses, I guess. The first is uh, sort of related to the question that Charming Chalmers in the chat is asking. Um, why you consider like normative error theory is as, as a potential objection, right? If error theory is true, then, um, well, there are no, there's no objective moral facts here. So, or there's no objective obligations, moral obligations. Um, and so that would be obviously be to deny the view that you're defending. Um, how, how would you respond to someone who um, thinks that our moral judgments insofar as they're um, meant to be picking out objective facts or, or categorical moral facts are, are just false. So why be a moral realist? Um, obviously, I know there are intelligent, thoughtful people who, who uh, reject moral realism. So uh, divine command theory of moral obligation is a type of realist theory. And so we can make, uh, those of us who have this view can make common cause with some other realists who are non-theist or non-theists about uh, 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 the moral obligation against uh, error theorist or constructivist or uh, or just plain out uh, you know nihilist. Uh, but we also can make common cause with sometimes uh, people like Nietzsche who who are in a sense. Uh, or, or one of my fa- favorite books actually is, is oh my gosh, so, sorry here, I should have turned my phone off. Uh, too many junk calls. Now, um, someone like sorry. someone like Nietzsche, who basically says, uh, you know, to make sense of traditional morality, you need God, and if you get rid of God, you should get rid of that. So I think Nietzsche's just right about that. So. Uh, but I think the ultimate and best arguments are, uh, first of all, uh, intuit- intuitive arguments. I think there are what I call moral seemings, which some- there's something like evidence, but it's not, uh, it's not the kind of evidence that is conclusive or can't be uh, discounted or m- interpreted in other ways or discounted. You know, there- but nevertheless, I think moral truth, like religious truth, is a sort of truth that one has to have a sort of openness to and willingness to uh, in order to uh, to to accept them. And so I think the evidence takes the form of signs. I think God gives us signs as the basis for faith in God. But the signs, although they are the basis of what are called the theistic arguments or the proofs, I don't think that they really in the end give us proofs or anything like proofs but they do give us evidence. And I think moral seemings function in something the same way. So it's a question of uh, if I if I walk out uh, my door and I see one of my neighbors, let's say, beating his dog, uh, and I'm repulsed by that and revolted, and maybe I think I ought to go over and do something, that's how it seems to me. It seems to me that that's really the case, and that's what I ought to do. Now, I could, of course, interpret that in other ways. I know how anti-realists would would do that. But I have to ask myself, what's the most faithful sort of uh, way of following this experience and where it points? What is it a sign of? 
And I think most human beings do have a pretty hardwired sense uh, that uh, the, that the good is not something that is totally made up. Uh, and the same thing is true with what we might call decency or, or living in accord with our obligations. Uh, and the, the best arguments in the end are something like uh, existential arguments. This is this is the sort of thing where you have to ask, is your belief one that ultimately allows you to live as you feel you need to live to be the person you need to be? And I think the best argument against uh, anti-realism and morality is that it undermines or undercuts the sense that we have that our lives matter deeply and uh, and have real uh, depth and importance. Well, that's all I can, that's a quick, I do have a chapter in my book on why be a moral realist. So if you look at God and moral obligation, you can see what I have to say there. Fair enough. Um, but he also had another um, wonder in that I mean, look, this is sort of a general issue that sometimes people face when making arguments for God in that people have a bunch of different arguments for to establish that there's something with different properties, for example, that there's something that's a first mover or that there is something which um, explains or, or in a way grounds objective moral facts or something else. Um, but it's sort of another step, even if these arguments su succeed, is another step to show that um, there is one thing that has all of these properties, right? There is, it's, it's true that the first cause is also the thing which explains the moral facts. And so um, what Chalmers' Charm, question was, uh, roughly speaking, why I think that the first cause uh, is the thing which is good um, as opposed to something else. Sure. Well, um, I don't think the mere, if you take something like uh, a cosmological argument and say we want to posit something like the first cause of the universe, I don't think you would necessarily get the idea from that argument that the first cause is good. Uh, I, I, I don't see how, how one, one gets there. Uh, I know there are argument, people who try and do that. But I think uh, our moral experience is different because our moral experience is uh, this sort of sense that we are accountable, that we are in some way, uh, we, we're supposed to live a certain way, we're under authority. And so we directly sense, uh, I think, or we have a direct sense uh, that, that the one we are accountable to or responsible to uh, has this sort of moral character because the sense of being accountable is accountability for that, for living in a morally good way. Uh, so Kierkegaard, for example, says in one of his, uh, you can find this in his journals, that he says there's really never been a true atheist in all of human history, uh, just people who don't want to uh, sort of admit uh, that they are accountable. Uh, Kierkegaard thinks that we have a kind of awareness of God that I would call a de re awareness. If you have a conscience, you have a kind of awareness of God because conscience is, in a sense, God's voice to you, although admittedly the voice comes with a lot of cultural noise. That is, God's, uh, God's voice is mixed in with a lot uh, else that, we, that goes on, uh, much of what we think about what's morally good and right doesn't necessarily come from God. But if there is something like a core that's there, and I think there is actually empirical evidence that even very young children have a sense of right and wrong, a sense of justice, a sense of fairness. Uh, and psychologists, secular psychologists have increasingly uh, come to the view that this is something hardwired. So we do have this moral sense. The question is, do we want to sort of take it seriously and regard it as something that gives us insight or truth, or do we want to explain it away and see it as a sort of trick that evolution has played on us or something like that? Right. So I think to follow up, uh, Chama Chama's wanted to get on mic and ask a question. 
All right. So my question is basically just elaborating on the error theory question. Um, why should we take things like moral seemings uh, as evidence for, you know, moral realism? I mean, presumably, you know, moral seemings are in line with the hypothesis that, as you just said, they're just some sort of evolutionary trick. Right. So, like, why would we think that morality exists and that there is a first cause that embodies this morality or these moral principles? Like, why wouldn't we just take the whole system, including the unmoved mover, to just lack any morality at all? I, well, I think uh, the. Um... The, the way I, I would come at this is um, if, if you want to put together some kind of, you know, take, take a theistic worldview and compare it with the, the alternatives, whether that be some sort of various forms of naturalism, pantheism, uh, you just put them together and, and, and size them up with respect to all the, uh, the evidence. And I, you know, obviously it's possible that the first cause and the one that I'm morally accountable to could be entirely different, but that seems implausible or unlikely. Uh, it seems more likely that if if I feel uh, responsible to or accountable to something, that something ought to be my creator or maker or the, or whatever uh, brought me into existence. No, yeah. Uh, um what is that evidence that makes it more likely that you're morally accountable to anything at all? So. Yeah, no, I think you have to start before you ask about how do you interpret uh, moral realism, you have to first make the case for moral realism. And that's not a uh, case dependent on God. I think it's perfectly possible to be a moral realist without believing in God. I have lots of philosopher friends who are non-theists who are realists. Uh, so that case, I think, basically, it has to be made in the same sort of way that Thomas Reed makes a case for believing in the external world. Uh, the deliverances of morality are the deliverances are part of the what Reed would call the deliverances of of common sense. And uh, it's possible to deny the reality of matter. There's no uh, there there are alternative hypotheses idealists can give. To, to explain what looks like matter or the experiences we have when we say there are material things. And Reed's answer is, look, there is no way of proving the external world. Ultimately, we have natural signs, we have sensations, and we are hardwired to sort of read those sensations as signs that point to something, and we just find ourselves believing. In the same sort of way, I think people who live their lives morally, uh, especially when they're living, making choices, they sense uh, the goodness and badness of what they do, and they take that into account in how they live. And when we step back from life and reflect, we may think that we could deny that, but I think that that's a bit like being an idealist uh, and, uh, and not taking seriously, you might see, where the signs point. It's not feeling the force uh, of the signs. So, uh, Reed's moral epistemology, I think, is quite good and sophisticated, and basically I would follow his his line here. Uh, All right. Um, I want to move on to another voice question. Uh, Shinichi, if you're there, you can, you can unmute. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Thank you for doing this uh, AMA. Um, I wanted to ask uh, two questions, but I'll I'll just start with the first. Um, I quite like your analyses of, of uh, obviously, uh, Kierkegaard, but also I, I've, I've read some of your stuff on Kant and James. And I'm kind of curious because some people have linked um, actually all three, and uh, especially Kierkegaard and James, with sort of later Wittgenstein. And I'm curious if you have any views about his later views about religion, because I've never really been able to make sense of what he says with respect to it being a mistake to discuss religion the same way we might discuss disputes in, say, other parts of metaphysics or um, ethics and all these other things. And I'm curious if you had any views on that. 
Yeah, I, I don't have any strong views. Um, I do know that Wittgenstein was a great lover of Kierkegaard. In fact, he says uh, that Kierkegaard was the greatest philosopher of the 19th century. Uh, so I know he admired and read Kierkegaard and, and thought much of, as, as interestingly as did Anscombe, his, uh, his student, G.M. Anscombe. Uh, I once asked her uh, if she read Kierkegaard and she says, oh, I love him. He's one of my favorite philosophers. And I said, do you ever teach him? And she says, oh, no, uh, he's too good for that. I would never do that. <laughs> so, but uh, I don't really know. The, the anti-realist, it depends on your view of Wittgenstein. If you think of Wittgenstein as an anti-realist, then I don't think his reading of religion and Kierkegaard is a helpful one. I'm not fond of, of uh, D.Z. Phillips' work on, on the later Kierkegaard, uh, the later Wittgenstein. He sort of weaves Kierkegaard and Wittgenstein together in ways that I don't find helpful. So um, that I guess that's all I'll say. But I'm uh, subject to being wrong because I don't claim to be an expert on Wittgenstein. I see. Thank you. Um, and I guess for my second question, uh, I'm sort of this is a very broad question, but uh, do you um, have any thoughts on the sort of continental and analytic divide that? Uh, seems to maybe be less uh, of a thing nowadays, but uh, maybe was more so early, early mid uh, 20th century? I, you know, I missed the crucial part. Something happened in your, in the voice and I lost the crucial part of that question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm basically just asking what you take, what your thoughts are on the continental analytic divide. Oh, the continental analytic divide. Well, I think it's unfortunate. Uh, and I do think that People who are good philosophers should be able to read and understand people who do philosophy in other ways and, so to speak, translate uh, uh, one idiom into another idiom so as to see. And I think that, that some of the best people on the continental and the analytic side have been able to do that. So, for example, Nick Wolterstorff, who's a great analytic philosopher, has read and has some really interesting things to say about the continental people. Merrill Westfall, on the other hand, who's a, a great continental philosopher, I think understands uh, analytic philosophy very well and is able to translate some of what he wants to say about continental philosophy into a language that analytic philosophers can grasp. So I'm all in favor of trying to do that translation work, and I'm all in favor of recognizing that good philosophy is done, so to speak, uh, on both sides of the uh, channel and both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, but I also think there's bad philosophy of both types. Uh, analytic philosophy is sometimes accused of being sort of overly technical, logic chopping, uh, precision for the sake of precisions and distinctions for the sake of distinctions. And also it's accused of being ahistorical. I think sometimes those charges are true, sometimes they're not. Uh, continental philosophy is sometimes accused of being uh, obscure and uh, sort of reveling in uh, lack of, of clarity. And again, I would say sometimes those charges are, are, are true. I, I think of, uh, they, sometimes I, I picked up books from a, a, a well-known continental philosopher and I start reading and trying to understand and I just can't seem to understand it. And I give up and say, life is too short. Uh, but sometimes, uh, you know, even uh, a great uh, a man I, I think think of as a very smart and uh, very great thinker, C.S. Lewis, the uh, British, uh, you know, thinker. Lewis never really read Kierkegaard. He but he tried to and he gave up. He says I don't understand him. Well, uh, Lewis and Kierkegaard didn't seem to click. Uh, I I felt like I can click with uh, Kierkegaard and, and Lewis didn't. I don't think that means I'm smarter than Lewis. He just he came from a different cultural situation in which Kierkegaard's writings didn't quite make sense to him. So sometimes I'm sure when I don't understand a philosopher, it's because I uh, you know maybe if I uh, if if I'm reading some continental philosopher that I can't make sense of, the problem may be mine and not theirs. But nevertheless, uh, I, I do think it's an unfortunate divide. I, I'd like to be able to work across it, and at times I've tried to do it. Um, so that's that's about the best I can say. Thank you.
All right. Thanks for that. Um, so I, I had a couple more questions relating to your book on God and moral obligations and the responses to certain objections that you gave. And and one of the objections is a so-called supervenious objection to divine command theory, which says roughly that, okay, on divine command theory, given that God's commands could have been different, even given the same non-moral facts, then the supervenience of moral, fa moral properties on non moral properties doesn't hold. Um, and presumably that's a large bullet to bite. And in your responses, as I take it in brief, to deny that in the sort of possible worlds in which God's commands differ, uh, the non-moral properties really aren't the same. Um, even if, so in, the, in those worlds where the moral properties of some act sort of narrowly construed differ, there are, are, are sorry, narrowly construed are the same, there are other non-moral facts relevant to that action, such as God's desires, which make a difference um, to the moral status of the actions. <clears throat> Let me know if this is uh, capturing your point, but but my question so is, so sorry, go ahead and then I'll ask my- So far, so good. All right, great, great, great. So what I take it as a potential shortcoming of this response is that it's not always clear that the um, non-moral difference is the sort of difference which can account for the moral difference of, of, of the actions. Um, and I, I can suggest potential examples, but do you understand the potential worry here that, that well, that sort of difference, i.e. God desiring it or not desiring it or some other fact, supernatural fact, say, um, really wouldn't shouldn't make the difference of whether, um, I don't know, this particular act more narrowly construed counted as, as, as moral or non-moral. Does that make any sense? Well, I, I'd probably need to hear an example. I mean, I mean, the, the, the reason that I think that there are always going to be non-moral facts that could be significant is, think, think of this analogy. Uh, suppose that, um, you know, my, uh, wife uh, asked me to do something and of course i uh my relationship to her her relationship to me is very important to me and so the fact that she wants me to do it gives me a reason to do it uh that uh that i wouldn't have otherwise so also if a relationship with god is a great good and a really important thing then the fact that god desires or wants me uh to uh, to do something seems to me to affect the the question of whether I have a reason to do that act or not. Uh, so I, I, I guess I don't think the supervenience objection is one of the ones I worry about the most. Uh, there, there are other objections that I think give me more, more difficulty. It just seems so, straightforwardly true that the fact that God desires or wants something uh, is going to, and it would have to be if God gives a command, then uh, that that's going to be different. So his desires and will are going to be different because his commands are expressions of his will. Right. I, I guess it's just that um, a lot of people might have the intuition that, okay, think of a, some particular action. Um, I don't know, stealing something from someone else. Um, most people are not going to have the intuition that what whether God desires that or doesn't desire that, that's not going to make a difference to the moral status of that action. Um, and so I think this yeah. is a sort of kind of example that some people might have in, in mind. Well, certainly if, if, if you think of a divine command theory as a kind of what you know god can sort of arbitrarily will anything and whatever he wills would be morally obligatory uh without any qualifications but the kind of divine command theory i defend is one which sort of undercuts the so-called euthyphro objection by saying right. that since god is essentially and necessarily good his commands are always aimed at the good and so the fact that an act is is bad and badness and goodness are independent uh, of God's commands. They have to be independent so uh, so that we can have reasons to obey God. It's good to obey God. And also uh, 
reasons why God's commands are not arbitrary. I actually believe that it's possible uh, that one version of divine command theory, what I would call a minimal view, uh, minimal divine command theory, is that once God has decided on the kind of world he wants to create, uh, he has no options about the commands he's going to give in that world. His commands might be totally fixed by the good and bad qualities of the world. So, uh, I, on my view, there are two aspects of what has traditionally been called divine command theory. One aspect is what I call the modal status thesis, which is that the that God commands an act, or uh, uh, wills us to do an act, and then communicates that to us, and that's what uh, counts as a command. Uh, that that is uh, what constitutes uh, being morally obligatory. So it gives the the, the modal the modal operator being more uh, uh, obligatory is grounded in that. The other uh, thing that's commonly associated with divine command theory is what I call the divine discretion thesis, which is that God has some choice about what to command. And I think it's quite possible that God has no choice about what he commands once he has decided what kind of world. He has a choice about what kind of world to make. Uh, for example, suppose God did not want to give us the command, thou shalt not kill. Well, then he would have to create a world in which uh, all beings were immortal and no one could be killed. Uh, so if we were all angelic, immortal beings, then the, there would be no need, uh, no point in giving the command, you shouldn't kill or shouldn't murder someone. So I think uh, one version of divine command theory uh, would be a view that we have no that God doesn't have any choices once He's decided what kind of world to give. I actually have a paper I'm working on right now. Uh, I'm going to read it uh, in the fall at a conference in Europe. Uh, but the paper is a paper on this type of divine command theory, one which uh, drops out the divine discretion thesis and says, that once God has decided what kind of world to, to create, his knowledge of the good then uh, determines what his commands will be. So, um, for better or worse. I don't claim that that's the true view, that that sort of minimal divine command theory is correct, but I think it's possible, and I actually think in the, in the paper I'm arguing this, that that might be one way of construing uh, uh, Aquinas's view, uh, and also maybe even Immanuel Kant, because Kant says some odd things. We all know that Kant says that the moral law is one that a rational being, so to speak, gives to himself, legislates to himself. But Kant also says that we ought to think of all of our moral obligations as divine commands. And he says that God is the sovereign of the kingdom of ends, which we are citizens of if we are moral beings. So how can that be? How can we both give ourselves a command but also uh, uh, have God as the sort of sovereign uh, who, in a sense, makes the laws. How can God make the laws? How can we think of all the laws of morality as God's laws, God's commands, but also think of them as commands they give ourselves? And I think the answer might be something like this. We, uh, God as a rational being, has perfect understanding, uh, and so necessarily wills uh, what he wills, and God doesn't have any choice. And perhaps we, insofar as we are rational beings and follow God, we necessarily endorse or say amen uh, to what God commands. And so we, in a sense, give ourselves these commands too. So I think it's possible to interpret Kant as a divine command theorist, uh, as well as uh, on, on one view of Aquinas. You, you could think of Aquinas as a natural law theorist who thinks that God's commands are valid because God has authority, but that God's commands are totally governed by God's understanding of the good. Uh, and so if you have a natural understanding of the good, you also have an understanding of our obligations because that's what God commands us to do. Is, yeah, that's, that. I think I understand a bit better now. When you say though, uh well in some way god's the choices uh, that god's makes god makes about which world to create may fix which commands he will make um but it, 
does it make a difference to the um, the good itself? I mean, it seem, presumably that what is good doesn't vary from world to world. Well, what, what good is instantiated varies from world to world. Mm. So, uh, so uh, if you had, let's say, uh, a world with uh, in, compassion, let's say, is a good in any world in which there is compassion. But if you had a, a world in which there were no needy beings, there would be a sense in which compassion would have no place in that world. It, and so it, there'd be no obligations to be compassionate or and so forth. Yeah, that's right. Just as if you were in a world of immortal beings, there'd be no obligation not to uh, commit murder. You, you couldn't, couldn't do it. <laughs> so, um, right. certainly, so, so certainly what's, what's actually good in a world varies from world to world. What's good as possibility as, uh, you know, I'm a Platonist about this. So what, what's good in terms of, uh, possibility is definitely uh, in, uh, true in all worlds. Uh, what, what's good, I think, is necessarily good. But what goods are instantiated in a, in a particular world uh, could be very, very different. So I can imagine a world, let's say, um, in which instead of uh, giving us a command, you shall not steal, God might give us the command not to own any private property at all. Uh, and then the, there'd be no point in, uh, if, if there were no private property, there would be no, no such thing as stealing. But I think God would have to give us very different psychological characteristics in order for that command to be good, the command to have no private property. I think in the actual world, maybe I can explain what I'm trying to say here by an historical illustration. Uh, Dun Scotus is often thought of as one of the founding fathers of divine command theory, and I think that's correct. And if you look at what Scotus says about the Decalogue, he says that the, there are two, what he calls two tables of the law. Uh, the first table are commands that God gives, that God necessarily gives, because Scotus says, like I do, that God is necessarily good, and so his commands are aimed at the good. So God commands us to uh, worship God and worship God alone because worshiping anything other than God could not be good and it could not be good for us and it couldn't be good in itself. And so God can't do anything but command us to worship him uh, rather than say idols or money or fame or whatever else people want to worship. Uh, but Scotus thought some of the commands in the second table of the law, God... Uh, had alternatives, so they were they were contingent commands. They're still aimed at the good in the sense that they uh, fit the good. They're aimed at the good, but there might have been other uh, commands that God could have given that would have been equally fitting of the good. So perhaps uh, God gives us the command, "You shall not steal," but He could have instead, Scotus thinks, given us the command not to have any private property at all. Uh, to live as, say, the early Christians did in Acts, having no, no nothing, nothing uh, private but everything in common. But maybe that's a mistake on Scotus's part. Maybe all the commands or most of the commands, maybe they're all uh, of the sort. If they're not all necessary, as the first uh, few commands are, they're all, in the sense, fixed by the good, so that when God has decided on the characteristics of the world, he's already decided and so it just may be the case that the command to have no private property wouldn't be as good as the command not to steal, uh, because at least given our actual psychological characteristics, uh, maybe uh, we we need private property to flourish as human beings. Uh, uh, owning things gives us motivations to work and do things that we wouldn't have otherwise. So. This is all speculation on my part, but I'm just saying it seems at least possible that we could have a minimal divine command theory that, divide, that denies the divine discretion thesis. All right. I think, I think Charming Chalmers was wondering in, in the chat whether is this sort of minimal or, or, or modest version of divine command theory uh, just another sort of, or at least consistent with, a kind of natural law theory, or is it is it not compatible with that? Well, that depends on what you know what what one calls natural law theory. But on my view, uh, 
uh, there certainly are versions of natural law theory that are totally compatible and consistent with divine command theory. Uh, I think the two only become incompatible when natural law theorists try to collapse the distinction between the good and the obligatory. If you think that uh, that to say that we have an obligation is simply to say, well, uh, that's the best thing to do or something like that. So, for example, let's take a secular theorist like Wielenberg. He, he's not a natural law ethicist. He's a kind of secular Platonist. But Wielenberg says uh, to have a moral obligation is simply to have uh, a moral reason to do something and no reason, no good reason not to do it. So if you have a good reason to do something and no reason not to do it, then you're obligated to do it. I don't think that's correct. I think obligations are special and different. And I think obligations have a social character. So we, uh, we, 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 we gain, for example, certain obligations when we get married or when we have children or if you become a citizen uh, of, a, of another country or state or uh, join a club, if you join the, the Mason, the Freemasons, or if you join the Kiwanis Club or the, you know, something like that, you, you incur certain obligations. Uh, an, ob an obligation is a sort of rightful expectation that someone else has as a kind of claim over against you. So when I got married, my wife acquired standing she has certain uh, rightful claims she can make on me, and I uh, and my obligations are simply the counterpart to those claims that she makes. So also, uh, I think whenever we are obligated to do something, that means there's someone who has this sort of claim status over against us. And that's partly why I'm a divine command theorist, because I think there are clearly uh, obligations we have which are not obligations to other human persons. For example, I think we have obligations to take care of the environment and the world. And that's not, I think, reducible to an obligation to uh, be uh, benevolent towards other human beings. Uh, so uh, is, is that is that helpful, perhaps? Yeah, abs absolutely. And so, so what about the view according to which, look, the moral obligations, the obligations that we have um, we have in virtue of the sort of creatures that we are, that our nature has a sort of um, function or teleology that may have been created by God um, with that purpose in mind. Um, and it's fulfilling our this function or this purpose that is um, is, is, is good for us, right? That, that is what we're obligated to do in a way. Is, yeah. that, is that sort of you consistent? With the divine command theory, well, you certainly you divine command theory, on my view, uh, is not a total moral theory. It needs an account of the good because, first of all, as I say, to avoid the euthyphal problem, uh, God's commands have to be oriented towards the good. So the good has to have a kind of independence of the obligatory, and also uh, divine command theorists have to answer the question. Why should I care about what God commands? Why should I obey God? And I think the answer is not going to be because God commands you to obey him, uh, because that would be circular, uh, either that or worse, it would be a, a kind of Hobbesian view in which you're reducing morality to a sort of self-interest or something like that. So we have to give an account of why it's good to obey God. So we need an account of the good. One possible account of the good that works really well with the divine command theory is a natural law, a sort of Aristotelian type of ethic. But I don't think that's exclusively the only option for the divine command theory. Robert Adams famously adopts Platonism and incorporates that with the divine command theory. And I actually, myself, I don't think one has to choose. I think that uh, Aristotelian sort of accounts of the good, which view the good in terms of what's good for uh, uh, someone who is a, a particular kind of creature that has a particular sort of tell us or in, that seems to me to be a, a, a very important part of the story. But we also, in the end, might want to say something about, well, why is it good for there to be creatures of this sort? And, and why is it good that there are excellent creatures of this sort?
and there we may need something like a more platonic view. and i think actually if you look at again, if you look at aquinas he mixes aristotle with augustine here. he mixes aristotle and plato and and blends them well. and i think he does the same with what we might call a natural law account of the good with the divine command account of the right because what aquinas says about our obligations the natural law is that the natural law participates in god's eternal law the natural law comes from god just as uh, uh, it's something and so ultimately who is god god is the one who has the authority the responsibility for caring for the world because he made it uh, a, a ruler is someone who has the uh, an, an obligation to care for the good of a realm for which the ruler is the ruler of and so god is the ruler of the universe and so it's sort of speak god's business to give rules uh for the universe i think that's aquinas's view so on my view uh it's the fact that aquinas is a natural law ethicist shows that it's possible to combine a natural law ethic with a divine command ethic and scotus provides another example because i think scotus is also a natural law ethicist but one who accepts what I call the divine discretion thesis, while in my view, Aquinas uh, does not necessarily. There are Aquinas commentators who think Aquinas does accept a discretion thesis, but I, uh, I, I'm not enough of an, uh, of, of an Aquinas scholar to, to judge, but it seems to me. Uh, so uh, here's the way I would put it. A natural law ethic doesn't, is not incompatible with the divine command account of obligation. And in fact, the two fit together beautifully. But that being said, there are versions of natural law ethics which try, I guess, to give a reductionist account of obligations so that once you have the good, you have the obligations there. And I don't think those views work. Uh, for example, if you look at Mark Murphy's early book, uh, uh, I, I'm blanking on the name now, but he has an early book developing a natural law ethic. But when he gets to the section of his book where he's trying to explain why we have obligations to care about other people, he flounders and he admits that this is troublesome uh, and it's hard for him uh, and, and that he actually admits that you could live your life in a perfectly rational way seeking the good and live as what he calls a quasi-egoist. Uh, so I think that shows that uh, uh, bringing God into the picture, a God who gives us commands to love our neighbors as ourselves, uh, it's not only good, it would be good to love our neighbors even if God didn't command us to do it, but the fact that God gives us a command to do it and we're supposed to love our neighbors as we love ourselves means that we should not be quasi-egoists, that uh, it's wrong wrong for us to do that. And that gives us a, a reason. So my, my own view is that there's no problem combining them, but I know that there are natural law ethicists who think of these as rival views that one must choose between. I think most of these people are confusing uh, divine command theory with what I would call radical voluntarism. And radical voluntarism is incompatible with natural law ethics. Uh, but I don't think the kind of divine command theory I defend is a, a form of radical voluntarism. Oh, okay, I think I understand. And th that book you were referencing from Mark Murphy, is it uh, Natural Law and Practical Rationality, that book? Exactly, that's the book. Right. right. Yeah, I have trouble remembering titles and names <laughs> sometimes. Right. Uh, no worries. So I actually have one more question related to your book on God and moral obligation, then I think we'll move on to something else. Um, so another thing you discuss both in describing the view and, and responding to objections is how uh, God's commands are, are, are promulgated. Um, and this sort of objection that's made here, which goes roughly that, look, uh, some command can only impose upon us some obligation if we are in some way made aware of that command and, and, and the source of that command. Um, but presumably there are many who have not been aware, made aware of God's command or, or, or of the fact that they are from God. And 
seems to undermine the the claim that God's commands uh, are objective, like that we're obligated to follow them in an objective sort of way. Um, and yeah. I take it that your response is somewhat to deny that God's commands, we must recognize that they are from God in order to receive those commands. And also, uh, you want to say that in some way we are all aware of the commands, even if they're they're not all from God. Um, is, is that more or less what, you're, what you say in response to this sort of problem? So, on my view, the, the, our true moral obligations are, in fact, uh, that's what they really are, God's commands. Uh, but we can be aware of our obligations with, without being aware that they are God's commands or being aware of them as God's commands. Now, uh, what do I think is required for God to promulgate his commands? I think the answer is something like this. He must. We must be aware of what we are obligated to do and we must be aware that that the content of what we are obligated to do is something that we must or ought to do, that we have some sort of uh, compulsion to do them. Uh, but I don't think God necessarily has to make it clear that the commands come from him. This, this point is connected to the debate in philosophy of religion over the hiddenness of God. And, of course, since Schellenberg, there's been a lot of discussion about the hiddenness of God as a problem, as an objection to theistic belief. But on, on my own view, uh, the hiddenness of God is something that has, you might say, deep theological grounds and functions. I think it's very important that God uh, wants us to come to uh, know and love him without any sort of compulsion. And I think since moral knowledge is an important part of the process whereby we come to know that there is a God and know something about God, it's equally important that it's possible for us uh, to come to know the content of morality without necessarily recognizing God is the source of that content. Now, I think ultimately, if we... Uh, are open to understanding uh, morality, it points us in the direction of God. It functions as a natural sign. But it's very important uh, that as, as a natural sign, it doesn't do this in a sort of coercive or com uh, a way that, that gives us no, no choice but to so to bend the knee to what is morally obligatory. So I, I think God has very good reasons for, you might say, withholding uh, this as, as a kind of blindingly clear, uh, it's something that's going to be obvious in every, in every case. So it's important that we come, and I think conscience functions like that. Conscience is something like a natural sign. It, it helps us understand that we are accountable and, and if we think about it and understand that, we would see that we're accountable to someone and we'd be looking and trying to find who that is and, and, and so on. But, uh, but I, don't, I don't think it requires uh, that, that the knowledge of God be, uh, be there as present in the experience itself. Uh, although, in order for morality to provide us a way of coming to know God, it must be possible to come to know morality without first knowing about God. So more, mm. all, I think all versions of moral arguments require the possibility of moral knowledge, which is independent of our knowledge of God. Right. And so speaking about <clears throat> theistic arguments, and also you mentioned natural signs, uh, or generally you have a, a book called Natural Signs and, and Knowledge of God, A New Look at Theistic Arguments. Could you, I guess, first um, clarify a bit what a natural sign is and how they um, provide us with evidence of God? Right. Yes, I, I think I can do that. The, the whole concept is taken from uh, Thomas Reed. It's central to his epistemology. And Reed says... Uh, natural science work like this. How do we know, for example, uh, that other people have thoughts and feelings? How do we know the, the so-called problem of other minds? And Reed's answer is, well, we look at their faces. 
their facial expressions and their gestures. Uh, and we naturally, we are, we are just hardwired to see these as signs that point uh, to their inner states, which we don't have any direct uh, access to. Uh, and in the same sort of way, uh, we have sensations, uh, which are uh, natural signs of physical objects. That's how we come to know that there's a physical material world. So in my view, our religious knowledge and our moral knowledge is modeled on Reed's account of what we might call our knowledge of the external world and our knowledge of other minds. Uh, so this is ultimately something that fits better with uh, an externalist epistemology than an internalist epistemology, because it requires that our basic knowledge of a certain type is going to be knowledge that in the end is simply grounded in our psychological uh, uh, sort of proclivities. So why, how do we know there's an external world? Reed says, well, we're just made in such a way that when we have certain sensations, we form the belief that there's an external world. In a way, it's a kind of Humean answer without Hume's skeptical overtones uh, uh, to, to them. And I think that uh, that, that uh, we, uh, we, we should think of uh, knowledge of God as coming in that way. The, I take the term natural signs from Reed, but the whole project was inspired by a quote from Pascal, where Pascal says in the Pensees that God has given us signs which are sufficient for those who want to believe but not compelling for those who don't want to believe, because God uh, doesn't want, so to speak, to force himself on us. So I call these the sort of Pascalian constraints on religious knowledge. One is what I call the wide accessibility constraint, that the knowledge of God should be based on something that's sort of widely accessible and available to human beings as human beings. It shouldn't require a PhD in philosophy, or knowledge of nuclear physics or something like that. But there's also uh, what we might call the easy resistibility principle, that although uh, this the evidence is widely accessible, it's also the sort of evidence that if we wish to, we can explain away and, uh, and dismiss and discount. So in, in my book, Natural Science and Knowledge of God, I try to uh, argue that what makes the traditional, uh, some of the traditional arguments for theism uh, persuasive to the degree that they are persuasive to people is that they are, in, what, what these arguments do is that they articulate, they unpack natural signs. The cosmological argument uh, unpacks what I call uh, the experience of cosmic wonder. Uh, the teleological argument uh, unpacks the experience of what we might call uh, of the world as purposive, as teleological in character. And moral arguments unpack our experience of the world as having a sort of uh, moral order. I think there are other natural signs that aren't uh, embedded in classical theistic arguments. I think gratitude uh, uh, and awe and wonder uh, at the beauty of nature these are also important natural signs. So I think these are all things that point to God, and, and if we are uh, open to them and simply, you might say, follow them, they will point us in the right direction. Uh, so at least uh, that, that's, that's, that's the argument of the book Natural Science and Knowledge of God. Awesome. And so presumably different signs can uh, be stronger or weaker. Uh, so what do you think some of the sort of stronger natural signs for uh, the existence of God are? Well, of course, strength may be somewhat person relative here in that right. if I'm a, a, a very cynical, hard-nosed nihilist and I've made myself by living in a kind of uh, non-moral way, uh, maybe I'm Thrasymachus or something like that, then maybe uh, the the the... the the, the appeal of conscience is one that I no longer feel. So that's not a very strong sign to me, but it's not strong because of the way I've lived my life. Uh, so I think uh, that virtue epistemology can help here. Uh, 
i think that too much work in in apologetics and philosophy of religion and religious epistemology is focused on evidence and too little has focused on the character of the people who recognize or perceive or interpret the evidence so i think uh we we need to ask ourselves uh what sort of person do i have to become in order to recognize uh, moral truth uh we we have a tendency to think that evidence is evidence and that uh, evidence should be something that's accessible to anyone and everyone and understandable. And uh, But that seems to me to be wrong. Aristotle, for example, when he begins the Nicomachean Ethics, more or less says, you have to have been well brought up <laughs> to really do ethics. Uh, if you haven't been well brought up, you're in trouble. Forget it. Uh, you have to have the right sort of capacities, the right excellences, the right virtues. So here I combine a kind of externalist epistemology uh, with uh, also a, a virtue epistemology. And I, this is very Kierkegaardian because Kierkegaard thinks that the reason why religious knowledge has declined in the modern world or religious uh, belief it's not because we become smarter or we know more science or anything like that. It's because we have become imaginative uh, pygmies. Uh, our imaginations are shrunken uh, and our uh, passions, our, 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 our moral knowledge is shaped so strongly by our passions. So Kierkegaard is all about subjectivity. He's all about becoming the kind of person uh, who can feel properly and recognize the truths that come to us through our emotions. And I think moral and religious truths are often mediated through emotions. And that's one reason I've worked on Kierkegaard for most of my career. Great. And so when you when you talk about Kierkegaard there, um, I guess there's a lot of related issues. Uh, you know, these things have a lot of connections with a lot of things that he wrote on. Um, when, so on sort of human spirituality or spirituality in general, and, and also Christian spirituality in particular, um, what is, first of all, I guess, could you briefly describe, uh, Kierkegaard's approach to, to spirituality in this, in this way, and maybe what your take is it, if you, if you sort of agree with the way he construes things. Yeah, well, I do. My my last book actually is a book called Kierkegaard and Spirituality, so that's certainly right. uh, re very recently released last year. So um, Kierkegaard thinks that we are by nature spiritual beings, uh, and what that means for him is that uh, we, a, a spiritual being, is ultimately a spirit, is someone who's self-directed. So you are what you are in part, at least, because of of yourself. You you shape yourself. Now God is is completely spirit because God is perfectly ah say nothing shapes God other than God. We are creatures, and so we're not like God. Uh, we become what we are. But God makes us, uh, you might say, the gift or the uh, the presence of creating us as beings who have a role to play in becoming who we will ultimately be in becoming ourselves. And so that's what it means to be spirit, uh, to play a role in your own uh, development and becoming. But Kierkegaard thinks that because we are finite beings, we become always, and this, is, this will sound odd because we think of Kierkegaard as the arch individualist, but actually his view of the human person is that we are relational through and through. Uh, we only become ourselves in and through relationships to others. And so our spirituality is always worked out in relationships. Uh, and, and that's uh, an important part of the story. So we are, in a way, always molding ourselves in light of some ideal, uh, which Kierkegaard thinks provides us with, uh, you might say, our criteria for an authentic self. So a, a person who is spirit is a relation who relates himself to himself by relating to another, this ideal. That's a, practically a quote from The Sickness Unto Death uh, from Kierkegaard. Uh, 
So we are meant to ultimately relate to God. And so the deepest and truest kind of spirituality is grounded in that relationship to God. But we are, as spiritual beings, as free beings, beings whom Kierkegaard says God, as it were, releases us from his hand. He allows us the freedom to uh, ground ourselves in something other than God. And so whenever we do that, we are essentially making whatever we're grounding ourselves in our God, whether that be nationalism or racism or money or uh, being famous or, uh, or being beautiful or being uh, superior in some way. Maybe we think we're smarter or we're athletically gifted, whatever that is. Our identity is grounded in this. That's a kind of spirituality. But in the end, uh, forms of spirituality that ground the self in something less than God fail us. Uh, they don't work. They don't satisfy uh, our deepest longings. And so uh, um, I think there, is, there, is, there are forms of non-Christian spirituality that are deep and are authentic. I call those in the book Socratic spirituality. That's not a term that Kierkegaard uses, but I think he has the concept. Uh, clearly, he thinks he's a great admirer of Socrates and thinks that Socrates has, has a great understanding of human nature and, and the human self. So um, uh, I, I don't know if that's enough, but that's, that's, that's a start, at least, of what I try and do in the book. So I, right. I sort of distinguish these different forms of spirituality. There's what we might call idolatrous spirituality, there is a sort of authentic uh, non-Christian uh, spirituality that I call Socratic spirituality. And then there is there are various forms of theistic spirituality. And, and Christian spirituality is one specific form of theistic spirituality in which we come to know God through Christ. So for us, if we're Christians, our relationship to God is mediated through our relationship to Christ. Awesome. And, and for those wondering, that again, that book is called Kierkegaard and Spirituality, Accountability yeah. is the Meaning of Human Existence. That's exactly and, right. Yeah. And so when you talk about uh, the meaning of human existence, is that um, w what exactly does that involve? What, is that, what does that entail? It means that there's a sort of objective, objective fact about uh, about what we were meant to be, that there's a sort of built-in teleology uh, to the human self, and that uh, that teleology ultimately requires a relationship to God to be uh, fully itself. Uh, so, uh, right. But, but on the other hand, I, I want to say that there are people, uh, th that spirituality is a journey and Kierkegaard thinks that there are people who might think of themselves as Christians, who nominally believe pro Christian propositions, who are actually further away from, you might say, a truly spiritual relationship with God than people who might think of themselves as non-believers. Uh, so there's different ways of being on the journey and different stages of the journey. But ultimately, I think Kierkegaard thinks that everyone who... Uh, who uh, who is who is seeking will find. One of my favorite quotes in Kierkegaard is uh, in one of his books. He's citing Socrates as someone that Christians should listen to, and he says, "I know that Socrates was not a Christian." And then he has an aside, although I'm convinced that he has long since become one. <laughs> so he has a notion of eschatological mm. conversion there. Uh, right, interesting. <laughs> So, and of course, there's the famous example in concluding unscientific postscript. Kierkegaard compares uh, a sort of Christian hypocrite who goes into the house of the true God and prays, but prays in a false, hypocritical, arrogant, prideful way. And he compares this person with a pagan who is bowing down before an idol, but praying with all the inner passion of infinity. And Kierkegaard says, whose life contains more truth? whose subjectivity is truer. And he says, it's the pagan. Uh, and that's part of what he means when he says truth is subjectivity. So uh, in the end, it's not so crucially important uh, simply what, uh, what propositions I believe, uh, 
but how those propositions are shaping and molding and uh, the life that I am forming. And, and that's what it is to be a spiritual being. And it's possible, I think, for him uh, to think to, to have to have dealings with God and even have a kind of relationship with God without being aware that you have that relationship. Awesome. Um, so actually, I had another question relating to the incarnation, and, and that's of course something that Kierkegaard has commented on. Um, and so, on my understanding of Kierkegaard, which is admittedly relatively limited. Um, he emphasizes that there is something about God just that he is fundamentally different from us in nature. And to show to us what it is uh, that is fundamentally different between divine and human natures, um, he shared human nature with us. <laughs> this might seem, I guess, paradoxical, paradoxical in the usual sense as well as the Kierkegaardian sense in that in trying to understand the incarnation we're trying to understand something which cannot be understood to, to think something which in a way cannot be thought and of course um use the name sort of absolute paradox to describe this um i am sort of construing part of what he has to say there correctly and if, and if so could you sort of expand on what your view of the incarnation is and what more we might be able to say about this yeah, well, first of all, I'll just say uh, I, I'm a defender of uh, a view of the Incarnation that, that lots of people don't like. I, I defend a canonic view. That is, I defend the view that uh, when God becomes incarnate, he temporarily, in the second person of the Trinity, temporarily gives up omnipotence, omniscience, and some of the other omni uh, attributes. Uh, and so, on my view, the properties that are essential to being divine are not simply uh, the usual uh, omni attributes, but the properties like this being omnipotent unless temporarily choosing to limit one's omnipotence. So self limitation is one of God's attributes. Why? I think because in order to love another and really allow the other to be an other, self limitation is necessary. So uh, God's uh, God's character is revealed in the incarnation because he he limits himself uh, and gives up for our sake out of love. He does the same thing in creation. So crea creation is also a kenosis, but it's not as obvious or clear in kenosis uh, in creation. So, so the incarnation in part is something that reveals to us the nature of God because the incarnation is an act of self-giving love and God, uh, therefore, is showing us what God is really like. Uh, if, if we look at creation, we see omnipotence, but we don't see omnipotence that can limit itself uh, and out of love. And so that's why we need the incarnation to really, I think, know God uh, as God wants to be known and, and loved and served. So, uh, so I would say, uh, look at canonic understandings of the incarnation. And for Kierkegaard, it's very important that God puts aside his might and power and comes to us as an, uh, an ordinary human uh, who suffers with us, and not just for us, but with us, uh, and thereby shows us that his love for us is real. Uh, it isn't just something that he affirms in a verbal way but uh, he uh, he lives it. Awesome. And so I can I can see some of the some of the benefits, but also costs of that sort of view that we might think. I mean, in its favor, it's a way to kind of make sense of how the incarnation could work. That's not um, very mysterious or contradictory. But I take it that this is going to be theologically very controversial, that, that God is actually not yeah. essentially all-knowing or all-powerful. Well, in, in during at least during the, uh, uh, the incarnation, uh, the second person, God, the Godhead still has all the omni-properties. And insofar <laughs> as Jesus is uh, related to, connected to, one with the Father and the Spirit, he still in some sense shares or participates in their, in their work. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it is controversial, of course, but I try uh, very hard. I have a book called Exploring Canonic Christology, uh, 
and I have several essays in that book, Steve Davis has some too, and we try to show that kenosis is compatible with orthodoxy, with all the uh, traditional creeds uh, and confessions uh, of, uh, of the uh, ecumenical church. So uh, I would say uh, don't dismiss it out of hand just because it may look unusual or novel. or it, It's a way, I think, of doing two things. Uh, one, it really makes sense of the, the really human character of Jesus as Jesus is portrayed in the Gospels. And secondly, it, 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 there is just great religious power in a God who doesn't just tell us that he loves us, but in some sense shows us by sharing our condition. Awesome. And I want to, I will wrap up in a couple minutes um, since we're at the right of one hour and a half mark. But on, for those, and I include myself here, that are not, that familiar with with a lot of Kierkegaard's philosophy, um, most of what I know is kind of surface level stuff. Um, wh what is what is the some of the greatest things that we can learn from from Kierkegaard? What is it sort of the, uh, the valuable aspects of his philosophy that are really worth exploring further for those that aren't very familiar? Well, uh, I guess. Um... One thing is uh, simply what we might call uh, in the, the great project of becoming a self, that it's very important not to think that this all happens simply by cognitive knowing, that it's a project in which we have to acquire or develop certain uh, enduring emotions, what he called passions, uh, what we might call uh, uh, dispositions, emotion dispositions. Take take love, for example, romantic love, married love. That's uh, a passion. It's something like an emotion disposition, not something you're feeling at every moment, but something that manifests itself in feelings and that it you have a disposition to manifest it in, in the appropriate way at the appropriate time and the appropriate circumstances and, and so on. So, uh, Kierkegaard just helps us understand the importance and role of the emotions in life in coming to know religious truth and moral truth. So that's a very um, important uh, element. And he teaches us to, to think not, uh, not just about uh, the evidence for knowledge, but the knower, the character of the knower, the nature of the knower. What do we need to be like to come to know certain things? Uh, so that's what I would call the virtue epistemology uh, part of, of Kierkegaard. There's a lot more. I mean, I think his critique of Hegel is very deep and profound and important. Um, uh, there are things I don't like about Kierkegaard, too. Uh, uh, I read Kierkegaard as a kind of Christian humanist. Uh, but at the very end of his life, I think he sort of lost his grip. And so the last two or three years, there's journal entries and things that he wrote in newspaper articles that I think are very unfortunate. Uh, I think there are misogynistic elements. There are uh, misanthropic elements. Uh, and he sort of loses his grip on uh, the goodness of creation. Uh, so I, I don't follow Kierkegaard in everything and in every way, but I think he's a, a really important guide uh, and that if we, uh, if we, uh, I mean, he's like Plato. He, uh, he writes uh, and thinks that he can communicate not just through arguments, but through stories and uh, through uh, uh, metaphors. And uh, I think that's, that is part of the, of the story. Um, so, uh, Anyway, if you, uh, I, I will be working in the next few months, actually, on a new revised version of the Stanford Encyclopedia article on Kierkegaard. John Lippitt and I are going to uh, do a brand, brand new one that will replace the existing one. So if you wait a while, uh, you'll, you'll get our, our take on this. Or if you're really anxious, you can look at, uh, my, I have a little book uh, with Cambridge called Kierkegaard, an, an Introduction. Great. Awesome. So we'll, we'll wrap up there. Thank you so much for uh, being here and taking the time to answer our questions. And uh, it's been 
really great listening to all the things you well, have to say. Thank you very much for having me. I know I have stumbled at times today. I, I don't feel like I was at my best, actually, but uh, but I've enjoyed the time. And, and, and uh, sorry I couldn't take all the questions that I've seen appearing on my screen. Uh, but uh, people are always will uh, if they if they want to they're always uh, welcome to email me a question if they want or if they want to know more of my work I have a website stevenevans.com so uh, there's a lot of videos and things there you can check out so thanks a lot.